Hello and welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I want to cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize, and we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS Form W-9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today, and we want to keep that good feeling going, so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content, and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. Thank you so much, Jess, for all of that wonderful information. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Actual Tech Media Ecocast. Today is going to be super exciting because we're doing another installment of our Best Practices series. This one is about implementing advanced threat detection. Does that sound like something you could use? Yeah, I thought so. I want to start by saying a big thank you for joining us on the Ecocast today. We've got some of the most innovative leading companies in the industry, including Sysdig, Cohesity, and Census. And I want to say hi to all of you joining us today out there in internet land, and that includes Eric and Aaron and Morteza from California, Andrew, Salma, Soham, Paul, Jom, California. We've got folks coming from all over the globe and it's great to see everyone here. Love being here with you today. I am, uh, I am the always on Keith Ward. The other members of our world famous mod squad include the luminous Jess, who you've met, and the less Jew luminous, but still awesome, Scott Becker and Mackenzie Pudisi. Now, if that doesn't get you excited, although it should, you're sure to get pumped up by our prizes today. We are handing out three $300 Amazon gift cards and stay tuned because we're awarding one after each presentation. Remember what Jess said that you do have to be present for the entire event to be eligible to win. And with that, let's kick this sucker off, leading off today, batting lead off, you might say, uh, with an incredible keynote is the wonderfully named Ward Spengerberg. You know it's going to be fantastic with a Ward doing the presentation. Am I right? So Ward is the founder and principal consultant of Alt Green Research, and he has got a ton of experience in this space. So listen carefully to what he has to say. Ward, I love the name, and you are up, sir. Take it away. Welcome, and thank you for joining this session on best practices for implementing advanced threat detection, enhancing cybersecurity with effective strategies. My name is Ward Spangemer, and we're going to discuss various methodologies for implementing advanced threat detection. With the constant evolution of cyber threats, traditional methods aren't enough anymore. We need smarter, we need faster, and we need more comprehensive strategies to stay ahead of the game. I'm going to walk you through a couple of different ideas. Multi-layered approach, AI and machine learning, real-time response, threat intelligence, behavioral analytics. These can all be the beginning of a strong threat detection system. Before diving in solutions, let's consider why advanced threat detection is so important. Cyber attacks have evolved to sophistication. Think about recent high profile attacks. We had DarkSide, ransomware as a service, take down Colonial Pipeline. We had Revolt, take down Acer, JBS USA. And then Lockbit 3.0, it targeted Australia, the entire country. These aren't isolated incidents either. These are part of a growing trend of incre increasingly sophisticated attacks. Businesses now face the risk of huge financial losses, reputational damage, and hefty legal penalties if they don't have the right defenses in place. Today, it's not about having a firewall or antivirus. It's about detecting and stopping threats before they cause any damage. Simply put, we need the right technology, processes, and people to detect and mitigate threats quickly. The faster you detect a threat, the better you can mitigate the impact. So let's look at some of those key solutions I want to talk about. We're going to first talk about a multi-layered approach in design. Then we'll move on to AI and machine learning, real-time analysis and response, threat intelligence, user and entity behavior analytics, all become foundational to building a robust threat detection strategy. 
Each of these plays a unique role in creating a proactive defense system for your enterprise. The first thing we're going to discuss is a multi-layered approach. This isn't about relying on a single tool or strategy anymore. Instead, it's about building multiple defense layers to protect your infrastructure. We're talking about firewalls, endpoint detection tools, email security systems, network traffic analysis. Each layer serves a different purpose, from filtering out known threats at the perimeter to identifying suspicious activities within your internal network. It's like having multiple locks on your front door. If one fails, another is there to catch the threat. A multi-layered approach significantly reduces those chances of a successful breach. Now let's talk about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Threats are evolving at such a rapid pace that traditional signature-based detection just can't keep up anymore. This is where AI and machine learning shine. An AI system can learn what is normal activity across your organization, and then they can detect anomalies that might indicate something's wrong things that even the best human security teams might miss. For example, AI can spot unusual login attempts or unexpected data transfers, even if the malware hasn't been seen before. And as AI learns from each event, it gets better over time at predicting and stopping new threats. Your key point to walk away with, AI's ability to continuously learn from those evolving threats makes it a critical component in a modern threat detection infrastructure. The next critical piece is real-time analysis and response. Imagine finding out about a breach hours or days after it happens. That delay can mean the difference between a minor incident and a full-blown crisis. Real-time detection tools give you the power to spot threats as they happen and even better, respond automatically. With automated response systems, when a threat is detected, the system can block suspicious IPs, isolate com compromised devices, and stop malicious activity immediately. This reduces response times from hours to minutes, limiting the damage before it spreads. Real-time analysis and rapid responses prevent threats from spreading, limiting that damage and reducing your recovery time. Another game changer in threat detection is threat intelligence. Think of it as a global radar system for cyber threats. Instead of waiting to be hit, you can use actual threat intelligent feeds to learn about new and emerging threats happening elsewhere. This might include known malicious IP addresses, domains, or malware signatures. By integrating this intelligence into your security system, you can proactively block threats that have been detected globally even before they reach your network. It's a powerful way to stay ahead of attackers attackers. Key point, threat intelligence adds a critical context to your existing security operations, improving your ability to preemptively defend against new threats. Lastly, let's focus on user and entity behavior analytics, or UEBA. Cyber criminals are always looking for ways to bypass traditional defenses, often using stolen credentials or leveraging insider threats. UEBA helps by building a baseline of normal activity for your users and systems. When a behavior deviates from that baseline, say an employee is accessing data at odd hours, downloading unusually large amounts of files, or logging in from an unexpected location, it flags that as suspicious. This is critical for spotting insider threads or compromised accounts that may otherwise go unnoticed. Your key point, UEBA provides advanced detection capabilities for sophisticated threats, especially those that traditional tools might miss. I have a couple of case studies to look at here. A major global bank faced an increase in sophisticated phishing attacks, insider threats, and attempts to compromise customer financial information. They needed to protect this highly sensitive data in a complex multinational environment with both internal and external threats. They implemented multi-layer defense, AI power detection, and user behavior analytics. With those measures, they were able to reduce phishing incidents by 90% and even detect insider threats before they escalated. One impressive stat is their mean time to respond to incidents was reduced to just 15 minutes thanks to real-time automated responses. This case shows that in integrating AI, UEBA, and a multi-layered approach leads to faster, more effective threat detection. In another case, DEF Insurance, a large health insurance provider, faced threats targeting their customer database, including ransomware, credential theft, and nation-state actors actually attempting to steal sensitive health records. 
They used AI and ML-based solutions to monitor system behavior and detect potential ransomware threats. By integrating that real-time detection with automated responses, they cut down potential ransomware infections by 85%. They also blocked over 1,500 malicious IPs before they could ever reach their network, all thanks to threat intelligence and real-time monitoring. To summarize, I know we've covered a lot today, but it boils down to this. Multi-layered security ensures that even if one defense fails, another is there to help catch that threat. AI and machine learning detect sophisticated attacks faster and more accurately than humans or signature-based attacks. Real-time analysis and response ensure that when threats are detected, they are immediately dealt with before they can spread. Threat intelligence lets you stay proactive and block known threats before they can attack you. UBA is essential for spotting anomalies and user behavior that could indicate insider threats or compromised accounts. In conclusion, as threats become more advanced, so must our defenses. It's not just about having tools in place. It's about integrating them in a holistic strategy that is proactive, intelligent, and adaptive. Remember this mantra, detect early, respond instantly, evolve continuously. With these practices, your organization can be better equipped to stay ahead of cyber criminals. Thank you for your attention today. If you have further questions, feel free to reach out, at, reach out to me at wardspan at allgreenresearch.com. Thank you again, and now back to your host. And that would be me. Hey, thanks so much, Ward. Love the name, love the presentation. So much good stuff in there to get us ready for the rest of this event today, including now we've got a poll question up that we'd love you to respond to. The question is, what is your time frame for adding new or updating existing IT solutions at your company. We've got four choices for you there. Please let us know uh, what you're looking at. Are you still in the planning stages or have you started a, uh, an upgrade at this point? This kind of feedback is enormously important to us and to our sponsors who make all this great content possible. So keep voting uh, while we've got another minute or so to do it. I am seeing the, the largest uh, bulk of you are not sure when you are going to be doing these upgrades. Um, coming in second is uh, maybe a year or two away. Uh, third is six to 12 months and about 14% um, of you so far are like right in the midst of something right now or just beginning. So thank you so much for that feedback. Um, and with that, folks, I think it is time to start going with the uh, main event here. What do you say, huh? You all ready for some good stuff coming up? I think so. So we're going to get to that right now. This first session comes from Sysdig, and presenting for Sysdig today are Loris Dejani, founder and CTO, and Eric Carter, director of product marketing. Our speakers, I am told, are ready and waiting, so I am going to turn it over to them right now. Super happy, Loris, to be with you today. I, I would say you have this pedigree around technology, right? co-creator of Wireshark, founder and creator of Sysdig. I just wanted to kind of kick us off as we talk about, there's so much going on in the market around AI. I created this word cloud because so many things to get your head around and, 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 and learn. I guess I'm interested in your point of view. Like what, what are your thoughts on the promise of AI? Where is this technology taking us? It's an open question. It's also probably an open answer. Wow, I, I'm I'm here witnessing really one of those eras, you know, not only in technology, but also in humankind that are really like inflationary, right? There, there, yeah. there's something that is clearly going to have an impact globally on on the whole humanity that is going to be very profound, and we're clearly at the very very beginning here, uh, and but it is obvious that uh, you know the future of mankind will remember life before ai and after ai this is true for everything it will impact so many areas of our our life but i also believe that specifically 
in software, there's uh, both uh, a big concern because uh, these uh, large language models definitely will uh, be used by attackers uh, to uh, make attacks more and more sophisticated and faster and faster. But there's also, a, in my opinion, a, a huge promise in terms of uh, what uh, an LLM can do to uh, support our workflows, to make us more effective, to help us detect, prevent, and uh, resolve uh, issues faster. And uh, in general, uh, has the potential to help us you know, uh, have better security uh, and respond faster. So since day one SSD, we've been very excited about the potential applications uh, of uh, uh, AI to what uh, we and uh, our users and customers do. And uh, I've been involved, uh, you know, like personally in uh, our AI initiatives as big and in particular uh, involved with Sage. For our customers who are trying to better secure their clouds, their, that's kind of where we want to go in the conversation next is as we started thinking about AI for cloud security, like. What did you have in mind? I mean, what, what are the principles that guided, you know, for what we will show in a little bit, how to use AI in our solution or to, to help this mission of securing clouds? Yeah, immediately when we started playing, let's say, the early prototypes uh, of, uh, of Sage and just started exploring this technology, uh, we immediately got the sense that uh, there was uh, a lot of potential here and um, what we were seeing, you know, in terms of uh, offerings at that point was uh, powerful, cool, but uh, still relatively limited. Um, mostly what was available at that point and still now, you know, like in, in cybersecurity solution is um, largely oriented toward maybe like natural language querying of data sets, uh, uh, this is something that uh, works pretty well when you have uh, like your security signals collected somewhere and you can like query them using English or, or some other language instead of having to write like SQL queries or, 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 or use some kind of like domain specific language. And uh, that is powerful, but uh, I feel that uh, um, what uh, large language models, especially, you know, the latest generation one bring us in terms of uh, uh, capabilities goes beyond it. And when started working on Sage, we had like these goals. One was uh, uh, the uh, ability to do, uh, uh, to cover multiple uh, areas and multiple domains. This is uh, useful in general, but in particular, you know, cloud security is uh, intrinsically uh, a world where products offer different kinds of functionality. A product like Cisdic Secure, for example, has vulnerability management, runtime security, compliance, uh, incident response, uh, and many other, you know. So uh, it's important for an assistant for a product like this to be able to essentially navigate across different domains and answer questions in a way that uh, allows the user to explore, you know, uh, in in breadth uh, of, uh, of knowledge, but also to be able to explore in depth. And what I mean is uh, going deep, asking follow-up questions, asking for clarifications. So the conversational multi-step uh, kind of uh, nature was very important for us as well. So in, typically when you're trying to address a security incident uh, or investigate an attack, it's not only just uh, I ask a question and I get an answer in text uh, or, or, or visually and so on, but it's more like, okay, uh, I got this information, now let's uh, dive deeper maybe in, into this. And what about that? And now let's actually talk about this 
thing that seems a little bit suspicious as well. So we wanted to infuse Sage into this kind of thing because it's like if you are investigating something like with a colleague, that's what you do, you know, it's like iteration and it's uh, uh, following up and so on and so forth. We uh, wanted to make sure that Sage is uh, uh, capable of uh, uh, understanding well, essentially, you know, the context uh, and the details uh, about this kind of technologies that uh, SysDig brings to the market under the form of open source uh, software. An AI assistant should be able to touch or understand all these different aspects of your cloud security. You know, this idea that you can have a conversation, this multi-step reasoning. Tell us a little bit more about what that exactly means. Like one of the things that we think is pretty unique is this idea that it understands sort of the flow of the conversation that it's having with you. Goal uh, here was uh, uh, giving uh, Sage as an assistant. Yeah, we, we wanted to give uh, uh, Sage as much freedom as possible to uh, actually act as, as, as a real assistant. And, and there's a little bit of, of trade-off there because uh, um, you want, of course, the answers to be uh, precise uh, and, and accurate. Uh, yeah. But you also don't want to constrain the AI, the assistant, too much into offering pre-prepared -pre statements, right? So there was quite a bit of uh, experimentation and uh, and design and tuning that went into trying to find right the, the right ingredients there that would allow us to offer something that is uh, very accurate, but at the same time that uh, you can sort of drive in, in different directions. And as I was saying before, one of the uh, important goals of this was uh, being able to really do like a potentially a drill down process, either either top down or bottom up actually uh, with, with the AI so that uh, um, there's essentially freedom to actually, you know, like potentially do like an investigation. And this is especially true with uh, the what we launched, you know, recently, which is uh, like runtime investigation supported by, by Sage. And in, in a flawless scenario like that, uh, the ability to like free range a little bit with, uh, with the AI and explore things that have not been predefined by us. And just as a, a, a general conversation, uh, you know, I use it every day and it's, and it's pretty powerful. As have I, and you saw my title, right? Marketing and what's underpinning our, 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 our runtime security rules. There's a lot of them and some, some of them are just, I'm like, yeah, I know exactly what that is. And sometimes not so much. And I can just ask, right? And I get a, a good answer, plain language that helps me know. And I, I think that's one of the promises here, right? Uh, I know there are people in security teams of lots of different skill levels. Uh, this is, I think, helpful obviously for the rookies, uh, potentially just the time savings for the experienced ones, right? Where they can just confirm what they already are thinking uh, and things like that, right? To get quick answers without having to go somewhere else. Uh, yeah, and uh, even even the expert cannot know everything, you know? Uh, it's, it's absolutely normal and natural. Uh, and one thing that I'm noticing is uh, uh, even when I'm just exploring, you know, like maybe our uh, uh, environments uh, with, with, with Sage, the actual time saving comes when there's the thing that maybe you already know, but typically you need to do a Google search, you know, to validate or to interpret it, you know, or something like that. And uh, yeah. Sage uh, sometimes really saves you, you know, the, the kind of time which is extremely beneficial and, and, and like, even if you are an expert and, and, and are very well prepared, still makes you much more productive. In my so not only am I augmenting my knowledge, I'm getting it more quickly. For the audience, I like to say we're obsessed with time. And why? Because what we have found is that, and through some of our threat research, that attacks move quickly in the cloud. Uh, and everyone wants to be able to get ahead of it right and getting ahead of it means you need to be able to be more streamlined at getting answers and that is you know the benchmark that we've sort of set out in the market for everyone that doesn't know it and i'll ask you to comment on how sage helps here should be obvious but um 
you know, five, 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 which means, hey, if it, it, it what we've seen is it takes a, as little as 10 minutes for someone to have their way with your environment, your data, once they have the, the keys, right? And so ideally we're able to detect quickly, five seconds. Uh, real time is important to Sysdig. That's why uh, part of what we talk about. Five minutes to correlate. I see Sage coming into this step, Loris. Correlation, correlation, uh, understanding what's going on and five minutes to respond. We believe strongly that AI for cloud security can be a super uh, helpful tool in achieving this goal. Yeah, and by the way, uh, the reason why attacks in the cloud are becoming that fast, I mean, we, we use this number 10 minutes because it's actually, you know, last year our threat research team did an, an analysis of uh, like the incidents across our customer base. And we saw that uh, on average, you know, the data center kind of attacks last days, like like 21 days on average, while uh, attacks in the cloud are tend to be super fast, like 10 minutes uh, or less. And um, the reason for that is mostly that uh, uh, in the cloud, you know, we're all operating our infrastructures in standardized API-based uh, infrastructures that are sort of very uh, all similar, right? So uh, scripting these attacks becomes much feasible for the attackers. In the traditional data center, you know, lateral movement was uh, typically network lateral movement. You land into an asset and then you need to slowly and gradually, you know, expand, do network reconnaissance, uh, try to find other targets, uh, all of the kind of stuff. In the cloud, uh, you uh, have a script that uh, can enumerate, you know, all of the resources that you have uh, around you pretty easily. There's a gazillion services in uh, a cloud like AWS or, or Google and so on. And of uh, these gazillion services, very often, many of them, we don't even know that we have them, but the attackers can quickly enumerate them and find the little hole there and move laterally by, you know, using identity, uh, especially. So that can all happen very quickly because it's, it's much more feasible to script it. And as I was saying, even for the attackers, AI, is uh, something that they use to do this kind of automation and accelerate the speed of their attacks. That's why AI and an AI assistant uh, is also so important for the, for the defender. Because as attacks accelerate in speed, uh, as attackers uh, you know, speed up uh, the way they do things, uh, us as defenders need to use every tool that we have uh, available for us to be as fast as we can as well. And AI is an important one, in my opinion. It's like showing up to a gunfight with a knife, right? It's, it, <laughs> you really, exactly. you need to show up and use this, a similar weapon, let's say, uh, as the bad guys. So yeah, and that's absolutely what, what we see, AI in the hands of everyone. Let's make sure we're using it for, for good on our side, right? Because uh, yeah. the evil guys are doing it. I think next, Good step, but just be show how what we've done, what we've implemented, get you into a, the demo part. And uh, yeah, just keep sharing along the way insights, I guess, and things that you've learned and why uh, why this is so powerful. So we are now in uh, the user interface of Systic Secure. In particular, we are in the threads section. And um, when Sage is enabled for you in uh, Systic Secure, you uh, at we'll see on the right side of the screen, the Sage bar that you can expand and Sage, you know, sits there uh, as an assistant that you can essentially start interacting with at uh, uh, any time. You can ask, you know, uh, different types of questions. For example, um, we can start with something high level, like uh, what are the most targeted uh, Kubernetes clusters. Architecturally, the way this works is uh, Sage receives my question and uh, it's able to query a Sysdig Secure, uh, establish a connection to our backend and uh, uh, fetch the data 
based on the question that I ask, uh, receives the data, interprets it, and is able to craft an answer for me that I see on the screen that is uh, essentially, you know, like the information that I ask. In, in this case, in particular, I was in, interested in Kubernetes cluster. So I see essentially the Kubernetes cluster that have received most runtime event. Uh, a couple of things to notice, as you can see, Sage is able to prepare the information for me in a nice, uh, uh, well displayed way. But also I have view events, you know, for uh, each of uh, the entries. So this uh, uh, shows how Sage uh, allows me essentially, as you can see, when I click on one of my clusters, immediately uh, the user interface up updates for me with a specific cluster that uh, I would like to investigate. And uh, this is a way for Sage to be not only, let's say, um, reactive to my questions, but also to proactively help me essentially uh, perform my tasks and, and my investigations. And this is another thing that was important for us as a design choice for Sage. Sage should uh, uh, be a helpful assistant that uh, helps me understand and answer uh, my, the questions that I have. But it should also be uh, somebody that actively sits near me and allows me you know, to uh, discover, navigate, uh, and take advantage of the product in the best possible way. Sage, uh, if I've identified that there's something bad here, uh, the question is, uh, what do I do now? You know, uh, how can I potentially fix it? So let's just say, Sage, what do I do now? Even, you know, just like a generic question like this. And as you can see, Sage, based on the context of what's happening in this cluster, based on the events that have been received, uh, gives me a nice bulleted list of steps that I can take to, you know, remediate this issue and uh, uh, potentially solve this problem and uh, close this, this hole that I have in, in, in this specific cluster. And of course, you know, like Sage is uh, powered by, you know, the best and greatest, greatest uh, LLMs under the hood. So uh, here uh, I can uh, absolutely do something like uh, in Japanese, please. And uh, uh, no problem, as you can see, now we have our remediation steps, not that I speak Japanese, but uh, we have our remediation steps in Japanese in case, you know, you live in any country in the world where you might want to share these steps with a colleague or something like that. And uh, you want to do it in, in, in your natu natural language, no problem whatsoever. We go for Italian. Loris, you didn't go for Italian, but that's good. That, uh, Japanese characters and stuff like that, right? Yeah, yeah I, I'm, I'm Italian, so I thought it would be a, a little bit too easy, you know? Uh, but uh, no, absolutely, Sage can do Italian as well. And very often, you know, when I do an investigation, I just start chatting with it uh, in Italian. And from that point on, Sage will just talk to me in Italian, no problem. Also, an idea of, the, of an investigation workflow all the way through remediation. I think this is um, really one of the big applicable areas uh, that bring Sage into first, right? And, and speaking of which, you talk to a lot of customers. I talk to customers. I wanted to share a few thoughts. And if you have any additional ones, let us know. But I guess we have recently launched the Sage for CDR. We have uh, got it in uh, controlled availability, and we're starting to get feedback, right? Uh, I think I won't read all of these, but my favorite is is the one at the upper left side, right? Where I think we always get a nurse like, oh, you're taking my job. And uh, but the CISO from Big Commerce identified it, right? It's like, yeah, now this is about making my response, a human's response faster, better. Uh, and so I think that's important to keep in mind. You know, it's a, it's a tool. And, uh, and, and it seems like most folks that are getting their hands on it you know, liking it for various reasons, right? You know, confirm my assumptions that I'm not making a mistake in how I'm interpreting this, uh, saving me time. They like how it's integrated in the platform, which I think you demonstrated quite quite well and that Sage knows what I'm looking at. It's right there. Validating what you said. Um, when designing Sage, it was, it was pretty clear from the beginning, uh, this is not 
uh, a matter of replacing what a human does. Uh, technology maybe will be ready for that in the future, but it's not ready now. But there is a big opportunity, we believe, in uh, empowering uh, our users, empowering the defenders, the good guys, and making them uh, uh, more effective. The other thing that I want to add is, uh, yes, this thing now is uh, in the hands of uh, our users. And I'm not going to lie, I was very nervous when we opened this up after you know months and months and months working on these uh, internally. Uh, with uh, our AI team at SysDig, putting this in, in the hands of people. Uh, well, you know, releasing software in general is exciting and makes you nervous. And that's one of the reasons why I, lo I love this job, you know, like company founder and, and CTO. But this was particularly exciting and, and nerve wracking because it's, I mean, it's, it, it's an assistant. It's almost like a a person that you introduce you know to to your users and your customers so there's like the technicality of will the answers be accurate but also there's almost like a personality that you try to infuse in this you know and so uh, the feedback that we receive for the moment has been overwhelmingly positive uh, which uh, makes me happy uh, and uh, um, really sort of validates the fact that this can can truly be useful future gonna look like for AI, Sysdigs implementation? Any thoughts on where we're going next? Every day uh, while playing with this, there's like a new exciting potential uh, application of this. But I would say uh, in the short term, medium term, uh, it's uh, important for us to evolve Sage to become more and more capable in more and more domains that Sage can really help you essentially span across different domains and answer questions uh, uh, and, and do like investigations that are more articulate and involve uh, uh, other areas, uh, vulnerability management, posture and risk, action and response, uh, forensics, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So AIs and LLMs, uh, we believe, can become more and more useful uh, especially when it's a matter of uh, synthesizing things for you, uh, automatically detecting stuff for you, proactively come to you with uh, answers, even with, without you uh, having to ask, maybe in some situations. So these are all directions where we want to, to push Sage uh, in the next months and years. I put this together. There's a URL there at the bottom if you want to go jump and uh, after this and see more. Okay, well, thank you both so much for that presentation. I love the demo and to find out what SysDig is doing with uh, AI these days. Uh, and right now we've got another poll question for you while we get our next present presentation ready to go. We appreciate your feedback on additional resources you would like to see from SysDig. Please let us know what you would like from them next. I also want to, want to remind everyone about the handouts. We've got a link from Sysdig to learn more about their generative AI solution. So be sure to check that out now for more details. Now, it seems like we had a lot of questions that we do not have time to get to right now because the talk was so full of great stuff. But the Sysdig team will be following up, uh, responding to all the questions that you asked. Thanks to everyone who's responding to the poll. We appreciate your feedback. And I'm going to leave it up here for one more minute while I give away the first $300 Amazon gift card of the day. And the winner of the $300 Amazon card for this presentation is Patrick Diaz from Arizona. Congratulations to you, Patrick. Sit tight and we'll be reaching out to you to get you your card. And with that, let's move to the next presentation in our EcoCast. This session comes from Cohesity and presenting for Cohesity is our old friend, Chris Hoff, a senior product marketing manager. Chris has been with us before. He always is great. And I am looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Has to say. Chris, are you ready to go? I am ready to go. That is, that is quite the introduction. It's good to be back. <laughs> Fantastic. I always like to give you a big build up, give you a lot to live up to. No pressure there. So uh, so take it away, sir. 
<laughs> awesome. Thank you so much. It's so great to be back again. Um, so today we're gonna we're gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, threat intelligence or threat intelligence, threat hunting, threat protection. Uh, it's a it's a subject that's that's near and dear to my heart. I've spent a lot of time in that space, um, and and Cohesity is coming at it from kind of a novel angle, and and part of it is that we're hearing from customers, we're hearing from the industry that responding to to cyber events, uh, you know, we use ransomware as kind of the catch-all for, for a cyber attack, but responding to cyber events is becoming more and more difficult. Uh, as a matter of fact, there was a, there was a statistic kicking around last year that I saw that was saying that, that around 80% of, of the re recovery from a cyber attack was uh, causing you to reinfect yourself. Um, so, you know, first time, first time through is, is, is not working well for people. And part of that is because of our mentality and security historically. Um, we've had, we've had, you know, these, this, the siloed perimeter with our firewalls and our, our spam detection, we've been collecting information in, in things like IPS. And we've had, uh, what I'm just generally going to call antivirus on, on endpoints of all kinds. The challenge here is a few things. So first, it's a responsive technology um, where the, these technologies are only as smart as, as their latest updates. And it's an assumptive technology. What I mean by that is in, in anti-malware world, antivirus world, uh, we, are, we are looking at a file, for example, and saying, okay, it is either bad or it is assumed not to be bad. It's assumed good. And so, so that assumption is what gets us into trouble. Now, we're, we're also taking these disparate systems and we're jamming them out into a SIM and trying to do correlation and all of that. And, and that's a very manual process. Luckily, we've moved, we've moved into this world of, of EDR and XDR, right? Endpoint detection and response. Uh, uh, extended detection and response, which is which is bringing together a lot of this information, but we're compounding the problems because we've now got workloads that we're protecting that are in various places. Right? We've got workloads in the cloud. We've got workloads in data centers. We've got workloads on on NAS devices that are sitting under people's desks. We also have this disparate workforce. I'm sitting in my house right now doing this presentation. And that means that, that Cohesity's IT department has to protect me when I'm on the same network as, say, my Roku devices or my Nest thermostats. Um, now, we've, we've come a long way, right? This is, this is not to say that, that all of these technologies are bad. We've come a long way because what we've started to do, bringing, bringing all of this information together and, and uh, a meaningful way allows us to map the attacks to what I'll call best practices. And, you know, we're, we're able to track files over time and we're able to change our minds about their disposition. So this is all a good thing. Um, because uh, uh, it's giving us vis visibility across multiple security layers. As a matter of fact, many of these technologies are allowing us to see uh, uh, the progression of, in this case, a file uh, across the network, across multiple security devices, uh, and then start to make decisions over time. And this is, this is a good thing because when we look at the MITRE ATT&CK framework, um, we're, we're able to map these to, to, to various, various parts of the, the, the framework, but we have to remember that all of these security products are part of our network. And so they are, uh, uh, they are at risk of being evaded. As a matter of fact, you can see here when we, when we look at um, uh, the number of techniques that are, that are being used uh, to evade your defenses, it's 
it's the highest number of, of techniques that, that MITRE is tracking, right? Um, the, 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 the reason that I bring this up is because we're hearing more and more from, from the industry, from our customers, from analysts, that this is a problem that, that backup data can actually be a part of solving, right? It's not a panacea. It's not, it's not uh, a, a magic button. But what we're able to do is allow our customers to go threat hunting through our data. Because if you think about it, a backup is a copy of all of your production data. And so by having that, that copy sitting there, we can now do more with it, right? We can do, we can do more threat hunting. We can even do more analysis. Uh, the, the Sysdig guys were talking about AI. AI is an amazing tool to be, be uh, looking through corpuses of data to do analytics. Uh, but from a from a, a security point of view, this data allows us to have have uh, the ability to go threat hunting. That's going to have zero impact on your production environment. It's going to to be invisible to attackers, which we'll talk about in a second. And it essentially allows us to tr time travel because we can access data from any point in time, and then start to do comparisons for that, for that, uh, for that data, right? So we can look at file changes. We can look at changes to active directory, for example, which is, which is important since one of the first things that attackers do to, to gain persistence is give themselves a, an, an AD account. Now, this is, this is great as well. I mentioned, uh, the bullet point there about, uh, being invisible to attackers. Um, one of the things we have to remember is, is particularly in incident response engagements, if an incident responder goes in and, and starts doing their investigation on a system and they're looking for indicators to compromise all of the things that they do, the attacker is probably sitting there as well, watching them do it and countering their efforts because the attacker's goal is to remain persistent for as long as possible. Because if we if we do the same tactic, if we do the same uh, action inside of a corpus of backup data, we are out of band. We are we are going to be completely invisible to the attackers because we are sitting in a backup. Um, uh, I'm particularly fond of the the lack of impact to production because that is something that is is always a, a challenge it's always a, a balance when you're when you're threat hunting in particular but also you you have as as the incident responders will be telling me um you have to be very careful because if you get too aggressive you can actually break production right and you don't want to do that so so we can be as aggressive as we want and we can we can uh, uh find more threats hopefully faster and be more proactive about finding those threats. We can also, in, in a response engagement, make sure that we're finding those threats and, and, and not restoring them back into, into production. So how do we do that? What does that look like? Well, the first thing that, that we want to do is we want to we want to make sure that we've got the correct classification of our data. We're talking about malware detection. Why is this important? Um, First and foremost, we want to know where the important data is, right? Because the bad guys are going to focus on that data, right? Um, I always like to say that that in a cyber attack, if if my if my laptop gets compromised, IT is gonna is gonna give me a stern talking to and and then wipe my wipe my laptop, give me a new one. If our CEO's laptop gets compromised, there's gonna be people running down the hallways, right? Alarms are gonna be going off. That's because he has more important data than I do, presumably. Um, if we know where the da important data is, we know we can limit the, the amount of, of investigation that we have to do for where the attackers are going. We can even, in some cases, predict where the attackers are going to go next. 
And as a matter of fact, um, one of the things that that uh, that I've been hearing is that um, investigators are using are using data classification techniques in order to find the systems that uh, they can ignore while they're going looking for command and control systems, right? Because in, using traditional ransomware as an example, um, the, in, the, the encrypted system is, is important to you, but there's a, a system out there that's, that's not been touched at all that is where the attackers are, are, are executing their, their command and control from. And so we wanna find that so that we can chop the head off uh, and we can, use, we can use things like data classification in order, to, in order to help point us in the right direction. Now, the meat and potatoes of all of this, how do we, how do we actually go through the, the process of, of scanning through data? Well, um, in our world, we, we have the ability, we can, we can do anomaly detection and we can do threat detection uh, uh, on, on data and the backups, but we can also go hunting using Yara rules. So we have a, a continually updated threat library of Yara rules um, that, you can, that you can bring in and you can go hunting for threats and then you can take, take what you're learning and, and uh, bring it out to uh, threat intelligence platforms or, or investigate, investigation platforms or even uh, uh, platforms like VirusTotal, right? Where you wanna learn more about something. Um, the nice thing about this too is that that we can bring in our own YAR rules, right? Because because in particularly in incident response investigations, we're going to have a responder writing their own rules, right? And and then being able to do a being able to do a scan with that rule is going to allow us to uh, um, figure out what's going on faster. Um, adding to this, uh, as a matter of fact, we just announced it today. Uh, is uh, the ability to use threat feeds from companies like CrowdStrike in order to scan through your backups and be able to to search for search for the, uh, for for threats. That's expand that's expanding all the time because uh, not you know everybody's got their own threat feeds. A lot of companies are actually building their own threat feeds. So we want our customers to be able to actually bring their own threat feeds into into the, the backup environment in order to, in order to look, for, look for threats faster. So we can find threats, that's great. We can, we can classify data, but the other thing that we wanna be able to do is understand where the, where the targets might be. And part of the way that we do that is, is uh, an integration that we have with Tenable for their vulnerability scanning tools. Um, why is this important? Well, uh, vulnerabilities have actually surpassed uh, uh, things like email as the number one threat vector. Uh, and, and part of that, you know, to be completely candid, is, is because of the, the increase in, in IoT attacks and, and you know, fileless attacks and things like that. But it's also because there's more vulnerabilities out there than ever before. Software has become more complex. It's become, it's become more problematic. So, uh, so by being able to do an out of band vulnerability scan, again, we're having zero, zero impact on production. We're able to, we're able to, to, to figure out where things need to be patched before they, uh, uh, without, without having to wait around for, for those, those scans necessarily to complete in production. What does that look like in practice? Well, another, another uh, uh, integration here uh, with Cisco XDR. Um, we have the ability to, so, so Cisco XDR can, can detect something suspicious is happening out on, in this case, a web server. It can, tell, it can then tell us to take a snapshot of that web server of all of the the workloads that might be surrounding that web server in, in what you know people like to call the blast radius, uh, so that that we a have a a, a backup of, of those systems before the attack might have uh, uh, fully executed, uh, and b 
have something that we can run forensics on. And so that allows us to, that allows us to take those, take those systems, put them into an isolated environment and then, and then do our investigations. The, the isolated environment is, is something that, that we refer to as a clean room. And, and this is, this is both process and product. The beauty is that this is all product that our customers already have in place. Um, but it's a process where we're going to prepare for an attack. We're going to, to create a trusted source of, of software and, and, and phone lists and configuration files and all of that. So that, that when we, when we have an attack that we need to investigate, we can very quickly spin up an isolated environment that we like to call a, a, a minimum viable response capability. Right. You know, you might you, that might include things like a, a totally separate version of Active Directory. And uh, even uh, uh, some people have some people are backing up their phone systems because because part of what the, the attacker is actually trying to do as well is is stop you from communicating. Um, that allows us to run through an investigation. Not only not only can we use our own tools, but because of our uh, the way this is designed we can we can then go through and and use the forensics tools that uh, our friends and our partners are are using when they get boots on the ground and once we do that we're able to we're able to to move into what I like to call staging right which is which is uh, the place where we're actually going to clean up files we're going to clean up systems and then test them and then put them back into production and that's where things like uh, uh, tools like Instant Mass Restore and all of all of those traditional backup uh, tools come into play. To look at it uh, a, a slightly different way, um, this is what the workflow would generally generally look like. Um, uh, with with ease underneath with ease underneath. Uh, 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 their their words. That's 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 awesome. Um, but you can see the the workflow here as a way to to look at the problem of a cyber attack and a cyber response in its entirety. Right. Um, we've specifically talked about that sort of that middle phase of investigation. Um, but I'll point out really quickly that uh, most people who talk about clean rooms are actually talking about that bottom section about mitigation, right? And I mentioned at the very beginning, that's why we have that 80% reinfection rate uh, on first restore is we're not looking at the problem. People aren't looking at the problem holistically. And so what we're hearing, the feedback that we're getting uh, is, is that uh, by looking at the problem more holistically, by looking at the, the problem in a collaborative way with our uh, data security alliance partners, our incident response friends, uh, and 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 all of all of our other technology partners, we're able to pr provide a a faster response by res and restore clean data. And that, at the end of the day, is the goal, right? Is to is to get back into back into production faster and do it in a way that that we're not. Uh, we're not reinfecting ourselves. So quick and quick and dirty on, on what we're seeing as best practices for uh, incident response. I want to, I want to thank everyone for, for taking the time to join me today. And I know I've been seeing in the background, some questions coming in. Um, so if we've got some time to answer any of those live, I, I, I would love to love to do that. We Sure do, Chris. Man, what a great presentation, first of all. Uh, thank you um, for all of that. I love the point you made about uh, reinfection. I mean, this is something that we don't think about a lot is, you know, if your backups are corrupted, you're just you're just putting bad files back into your production. You're kind of starting over again. Um, so uh, while we get those questions ready for you, I wanted to put up the poll question also. 
Uh, we appreciate your answers on the additional information you would like about the Cohesity solution. Keep voting while we go through this Q&A and let Cohesity know what they can do to help you out. I also want to remind everyone about the handouts. We've got a PDF from Cohesity that is a solution brief on its DataHawk product. So be sure to check that out also while we go through questions, which we are going to get to right now, Chris. And the first one for you is from Nick. How are MITRE attack tactics changing over time? That's a really good question. Um, so so the biggest the the biggest fluctuation in, in attack in uh, tactics that that we're seeing are actually in uh, um, uh, evasion techniques. Uh, a lot of the a lot of the old school. I hate to say it like this, but a lot of the old school attacks are still very effective, uh, and that's one of the reasons why why uh, uh, you know ransomware has become the de facto de facto term for for cyber attacks because it still has a, a big part to play in, in cyber attacks. And in fact, um, AI is helping the old school attacks get better. You know, the standard phishing emails are much cleaner than they used to be, for example, thanks to AI. So our diligence, if anything, has got to go up even from there. I think you would agree with me on that. Absolutely um, agree with that. Yeah. So um, here's a question from Austin, who, Austin, who wants to know, how does Cohesity's data security solution approach uh, approach advanced threat detection for backup systems, especially in preventing ransomware attacks that target stored data? And that is 100 percent correct. The uh, the attackers know that if you really want to have success, you target the backups first. That's that is absolutely correct. As a matter of fact, there was a the, uh, uh, our friends over at Sophos had their their threat detection report come out. They said that that ninety percent of cyber attacks are are going after backup data today. Which statistically speaking, that's every attack, right? Um, it's not too hyperbolic to say. Um, the way that we're approaching it, first and foremost, there's there's the table stakes, right? Immutable storage. Um, a secure file system that that we've had since the very beginning. Um, uh, things like things like MFA, uh, which still a lot of companies are not turning on, is incredibly important. But also tactics like what we like to call quorum or separation of duties, having the ability to to verify that a change is being made is is helping us stop attackers from either destroying data or changing the backup configurations to the point where they're actually not backing up anything anymore and then you know playing the long game and waiting for waiting for everything to cycle out before they actually launch their attack so so there's a number of t of tools that we have that we 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 are turning on by default these days uh, when when uh, we're deploying with our customers uh, and 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 they actually have to um, uh, tell us not to turn those things on before uh, before they before they uh, they they or as they deploy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Um, another question for you, and we have time for one or two more before we let you go, Chris. So uh, here's one: Are you saying I can replace my endpoint? AV antivirus with Cohesity. Good question. Oh, that that's it. So so that's that's a that is a good question. So no, absolutely one hundred percent not. Um, what what I am saying, you you absolutely want to keep uh, your your defensive technologies in place. Um, what you what I'm saying is that you you want to be able to augment them to make sure that that a they're still trustworthy. Uh, uh, after an attack, and B, that you have more data sources, more points of 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 reference for uh, for your your response capability. So, no, absolutely, you absolutely want to use those those tools, and you want to even bring them into things like scanning your backup data. 
Okay, fantastic. Um, last question for you today. You have spurred a lot of interest based on the questions we're seeing. And by the way, I wanted to point out that Cohesity will be following up with all the questions uh, that came in today, whether or not they get answered because we are running out of time. But I did want to mention that you will be hearing from them. So last question for those who are interested in hearing more. What is the next step they should take, Chris? So, great question. Um, so, so no matter no matter wh what you're using for for backup, and and you know, selfishly, I hope it's cohesity. Um, look, look at take a strong, hard look at what your response pr response process looks like, and remove any assumptions. Um, what I mean by that is is if there is any part of of your response process where somebody says i think it works like this or it should work like that focus on focus on that and make sure that you have a definitive answer because it's the, it truly is those assumptions that get get us in the most trouble I won't make the old joke about what happens when you assume. I'll just leave it right there with your, with your excellent answer. Well, Chris, it has been an absolute delight to have you on today. Thanks for updating us on what Cohesity is doing. Always such an innovative vendor out there. And uh, we really appreciate your, uh, your time, your presentation, and your insights in the Q&A. Have a great day. Thanks. I appreciate the time. Absolutely. Thank you so much. And I'm going to leave the uh, the poll question up here one more minute. Please take your this is your last opportunity to let Cohesity know how you would like them to follow up with you. So vote in that poll while I give away the next $300 Amazon card. And the winner is uh, Bill Galland from Idaho. I saw Bill log in earlier today. So congrats on your win, Bill. We will be in touch ASAP with more information. And with that, folks, we are going to move on to our final presentation in today's EcoCast. And this one comes from Census. Presenting for Census is Dan Whitford, a solutions engineer. Dan, it's great to have you in here today. Can't wait to see what you have for us. You now have the floor, sir. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Whitford, a senior solutions engineer with Census. And I'm excited to share what we're doing here at Census and how we can help improve your data security for your organization. Our overview today will cover data security challenges in a growing attack surface, current tools you have today and where the gaps may exist, who is Census and how do we help, and to wrap it up, a demo of the Census Exposure Management Platform. So let's get started. The way companies behave with respect to the internet has completely changed. There's more sensitive data, more dependencies to critical parts of the business, and everything comes at us in higher volumes and at faster paces. We aren't protecting ourselves the way we need to. Policies and program philosophies don't always match the available technology, but the attackers we are defending ourselves against are rapidly evolving and up to speed. Visibility of your entire attack surface, seen from the attacker's perspective, is a fundamental piece of any security program today. Attack surfaces have grown beyond the scope of traditional security tools and practices. We can see some of the growth and explosion here from some of these numbers that we've provided. And where Gartner and IDC estimate cloud spend to continue to go. And the point is, Organizations do not know what they own or what they need to protect anymore. IT doesn't own everything anymore. The entire organization can expand the attack surface. So we get more exposures, more alerts, less time and less resources as a result of this. Security teams are already outnumbered. Prioritization is a difficult task now. Simple human error is creating a majority of the problems. And these should be easy to address if we know about them. This is just kind of a look at existing tools today, 
some of them responsible for giving you guys visibility, but it's not comprehensive enough and can often be out of date or inaccurate, which means critical vulnerabilities or risks are often learned about when an incident occurs. So for the, the left-hand side of this, the vendor risk management or security rating vendors, they're providing risk scores and posture assessments based on information they're collecting and providing to you. But they also have limited visibility or no visibility into supplier cloud configurations. Vulnerability management, traditionally scanning known resources that it's fed, it doesn't have visibility into shadow cloud. Digital risk protection, protecting the brand and impersonation. There's no visibility here either into unknown internet assets. And then finally, cloud security posture management. Great at giving visibility of cloud assets and vulnerabilities, but they only again protect known cloud accounts. And so we need to be able to address the unknown and protect what we can't see. Think about the current tools you use and ask yourself if you have answers to these questions. How long will it take my team to find everything we own exposed on the internet? How many cloud providers is my company using today? How quickly can we identify misconfigured or vulnerable internet facing assets? And most importantly, what critical exposures can everyone outside of my organization see? If we think about these questions, these are just some of the questions that are critical in understanding areas we can improve our data security practices. Since this is the one place to understand everything on the internet, we help you answer these questions with accurate and up-to-date information. Since this was founded by the creators of ZMAP, we invented internet-wide scanning and have continued to invest and innovate using our knowledge of the internet and cloud to help security teams protect their organizations. We provide an attacker-centric view of all internet and cloud assets, and we are the best at finding the exposures attackers will exploit. We know the internet and cloud better than anyone and are trusted by large organizations, federal and government agencies, to provide knowledge and expertise about internet risks. What do we do? So we've built the industry leading global scanning infrastructure that serves as the foundation for everything we do. We scan the entire IPv4 space and cloud providers every single day and have been doing it for the last five years. What this means is we see 63% more services than our nearest competitor. And we have the largest certificate database in the world, standing at over 8 billion and growing daily. With this accurate and up-to-date data, we're helping every part of the security program with our census exposure management and census search products that you can see here on the right. I know what you're thinking. Every vendor says we have the best data, but this time I can prove it. What we're looking at here is a recent independent study from Gray Noise. Looking at internet scanning vendors, they found census is providing more coverage of ports and services than anyone else based on that thick line you see at the top. And not only do we have the most comprehensive coverage, we also detect new hosts very quickly. This is just a small sample of their findings and all the vendors that they were able to reveal as part of their reporting. So I've included a handout for you all to review and take with you. And if you have questions, feel free to reach out to us for any answers. Now that you know who Census is and how we can help with best practices for securing your data, I wanna share more detail about Census Exposure Management and why this helps with your best practices for data security. Census Exposure Management, one of the products we offer, discovers, inventories, and monitors your entire internet exposure. Not monthly, not weekly, but daily. The external attack surface is assessed for risks and each is prioritized by what is important to you. 
And this is important because risk tolerance across different organizations aren't the same. So you can customize them to meet the risk tolerance of your organization. Providing an outside in view or attacker's perspective of each asset and exposure daily gives your organization more visibility and context so you can manage and communicate your cybersecurity posture proactively and prevent breaches. You also have complete control of the data in the attack surface, how sense is founded, the ability to add and remove assets if necessary. Remember, we know more about the internet and cloud than anyone else, and this is what enables us to discover more assets with fewer false positives. So census enables defenders to save time, address critical issues faster, and gain visibility of all your internet assets so that you can better protect the organization and its data. Let's take a live look at the census exposure management product. Here we are in the census exposure management product in our demo environment called Papertown. And one of the use cases we didn't quite cover yet was uh, mergers and acquisitions or subsidiary security management. Those are things that we can logically separate from the attack surface uh, if, they're diff if they're managed by different teams across different uh, subsidiaries in the company. We can split those out so that they have their own view of assets that they manage. But today we're gonna to look at Paper Town as an organization. We're here at the dashboard. And before we start to explore the dashboard, where I wanna start first is how did we build the attack surface? This is a critical component to ensuring that the attack surface is as complete as possible and accurate. So what happens here is first we provide census with seed data. And seed data starts with assets a customer knows about or high confidence assets automatically found by census. And these include IPs, domains, CIDRs, and ASNs. From here, a variety of other resources are checked for relationships with known assets, building out a complete view. Examples of other data resources used to build this view include hosts with CIDRs, with insiders, the subdomains from domains, and the certificates on hosts from our scan data. And then from all of this data, we can start to understand and make inferences about other assets in our internet data set that belong to your organization. And it doesn't stop there. In the event that you need to make changes to this data, you can easily do so by selecting the data here and removing it. In addition to the manual data you can add, Census also automatically discovers initial seed data. And the way we do this is through a partnership with Crunchbase, where we can look at Crunchbase organizations, type those in here, and then it'll go out and look at various who is records, registrant information to pull together list of subsidiaries, registrant information, the org, and emails for you to review. This is additional seed data that Census finds on its own through your guidance and can help build a more complete attack surface for your team. Now that we know how Census is getting its data, how you guys can control the input of it, what happens next is attribution runs, pulling in data from our own data sources and other third-party data sources to help enrich with ad additional information. And this happens daily. So now we talked about previously that the attack surface is updated daily. And this is critical because cloud has changed the way organizations need to prevent and secure things in the cloud. So looking at the dashboard here, if we needed a better view of our cloud inventory, we've categorized it. So now we can start understanding what is the makeup of our attack surface? And looking at the cloud infrastructure here, we can already see we're in Amazon Web Services. We've got some assets in Google Cloud, Microsoft Azure, 
and then other cloud providers. And this is where things start to get interesting. As an organization, you may think we heavily use AWS or Azure. Maybe we're not in GCP. And a lot of organizations are surprised to find out that their footprint extends outside of those big three cloud environments. So even into DigitalOcean, Tencent, or Alibaba. And from here, this is where we get the visibility to enable you as a defender or red team to understand the security posture of the organization and help those teams remediate these vulnerabilities. I'm gonna clear that cloud filter there for a minute. And we're gonna look at these assets. The assets in this attack surface consist of IP addresses, domains, web entities, storage buckets, certificates, and software. These are all critical components of external facing resources that we need to know about and be able to secure. Once we've discovered all of those things, typically the first thing organizations wanna know is where am I most vulnerable? Right, thinking back to those questions we talked about earlier. This is where census exposure management really helps prioritize your risk efforts and gives the teams the information they need to view them. So if we jump over, moving from the initial dashboard and inventory to the risks, we can start to see already, I've got some high severity risks in the environment, medium and low. And earlier we talked about some of these risks, we categorize them by default automatically based on the impact, likelihood and exploitability. But again, your organization may have a different risk tolerance for different types of things that need to be exposed for whatever purposes they serve. And that's where we can start to customize various risk severities on an asset level. In this case, we could change RDP. Maybe this is supposed to be exposed. It's properly secured with other mitigating controls like MFA, maybe restricted access through uh, some other security tools and we can change the risk severity of this to low, or we could even accept that risk, provide a business reason as to why, and then submit it. And then census won't alert us about that specific host risk, but it'll still be logged and documented. If we need more detail, we can drill into this specific host with RDP and get more risk context. So here we can quickly see RDP service is exposed on TCP port 3389, and it's been open for 10 days. Now, if this were something that were critical and we needed the team to remediate right away, and we want to verify that, we could simply rescan the host on demand. And below that, the team will get additional remediation recommendations and additional context to help them as they explore and investigate this and work on remediation. They also have the ability to integrate with ticketing systems. So now as you think of pushing this data downstream, making it more operationalized for some of the teams and responsible asset owners, they can do that from within the user interface here. We can also apply tags. So as you see here, tags added currently include investigate and unknown owner. You can add as many tags as you want to an asset, and then that makes it easier for users to search and filter on those. So from looking at a risk on a host, we can also look at the host summary. And this is where a lot of information is helpful for people doing investigations, understanding uh, recent host activity, the history of that host, what's changed on it, was a port or a service added or removed, same with the certificate. And then in another important asset feature here too is really understanding the discovery path. This is where census tells you how it discovered the asset. In this case, this IP address was found in a DNS resolution chain from this domain. And this is the root seed domain that was brought into the attack surface via one of our cloud connectors. And that's one thing we didn't touch on. We have cloud connectors into AWS, Azure, and GCP. And that just gives the organization more visibility into their known cloud accounts to add those into census for those external assets so that we can monitor 
and discover anything else off of those as well. Included will be some location information and below that, a preview of the protocols and ports exposed on the host and all of that scan data. So we provide all that rich scan data as it was scanned from census as some of this information can be used to look at the attack surface in various different ways to see if there's correlation between other hosts or other information that might be relevant there. And then finally at the bottom here, this host has a certificate on it. We can see that it's self-signed, but still valid. Jumping back to the dashboard, one important area I wanna focus on too is really this concept of web entities. Uh, cloud has really changed the way we identify and continuously monitor applications, and we need to be able to easily manage and understand cloud risks. Applications are distributed across a changing number of IPs, and so looking at just specific host level information or IPs isn't enough anymore. So what we've created is a concept called web entities, and this is a named based host on a port. And so as you can see here, we have a couple different DNS names with different ports. These specific web assets can be hosted across multiple physical instances, right? This is where content delivery networks come into play. Your organization doesn't actually manage the security of those. You're responsible for securing that specific web entity. Web entities can include uh, named websites. They could be Prometheus endpoints, Kubernetes, et cetera. And investigating these is very similar to the way we investigate a physical host. We come in here, we get a nice summary page of the web entity, town square, papertown.cloud. We can see it's got one low risk here based on this uh, green indicator. And then we get some summary information here as well. What URI was in the scan, and then what web entity instance is hosting this content. So we can see here, this is not a CDN. Uh, this is an instance in Amazon running Nginx. And we can get a little bit more information here on the risks. Any TLS information, TLS 1.3, and any other relevant DNS information. And then in the same way we looked at a host risk, we can look at a web entity risk in this way as well, identifying that it's got missing common security headers. It'll also have a discovery path so we can share how it was discovered and attributed to the organization. And then we can also look at the scan data for the web entity. And then we can even pivot off of this data to see what else is in our environment. So if I wanted to see what else is in AWS Cloud, we can quickly pivot over there. It creates a simple query, searches our inventory, and then brings us the results so we can do deeper investigation. We can also share related web entities, so another name on a different port, and then we can add some comments if necessary as well. So this is a quick overview of census exposure management. And if you want to take it a little bit further, we can certainly work with you one-on-one -on -one in your team to dive a little bit deeper into a demonstration of maybe your own attack surface and evaluate what the security posture of that looks like. If you'd like to learn more or work with us to evaluate your external attack surface, just feel free to scan the code and request a demo. Thank you. And thank you. What a great presentation, Dan. Um, Census is just one of those vendors that you need to know about and you need to be following to do so much cool stuff. And with that, we also are, have our last poll of the event up now. Please let Census know what additional resources you'd like to see from them. Also, I want to point out that Census has a great PDF in the handout section providing an overview of their offerings. Get it in the few minutes that we have got left. Now, Dan is unfortunately unable to take questions today, but don't worry because Census will respond to all the questions that you sent in. And while you continue responding to the poll, everyone, I am going to award the final Amazon gift card of this here event today. This is the third of three $300 cards, and the winner of it is 
Alan Herman from Texas. Hey, I like Texas. That's where my son is right now. Congratulations to you, Alan, and to all of our winners today. You will be hearing from us soon. So uh, I don't know about you folks, but for me, this was such a fun ecocast today. I learned a ton. I was inspired. Uh, it was just a great time overall. And if you feel the same way, I want you to know that we can do something just like this for you. It can be a multi-vendor event, just like the one we have had. It can also be a custom-built webinar just for your product or service. We've got all kinds of ways to work with you. So just contact us at connect at actualtechmedia.com and let's talk about building one of these just for you. Speaking of events like this, there's more security coverage coming up in less than a week, and it is a super summit on data protection and disaster recovery. Now, I want to mention that this event features a keynote by someone you're all familiar with who comes from a galaxy far, far away. Now, I won't spoil it beyond that. It is happening next Wednesday, September 18th at 11 a.m. Eastern time, which is a little earlier than normal, uh, and that's 8 a.m. Pacific time. And I promise you, West Coasters, that it'll be worth getting up early for. Sign up, in fact, right after the event ends, which is pretty much right now. On behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank all of our presenters today for putting together fantastic presentations, demos, and their insights in the Q&A. I want to thank our participants for making this possible, including Sysdig, Cohesity, and Census. And finally, last but never, ever, ever least, I want to thank all of you attendees for being here today, for spending part of your day with us, for your interest in the topic, for your great questions, and for just having fun today. I know I had a great time and I cannot wait to see you in the next one. And that concludes the EcoCast for today, folks. Have a great rest of your day.